Welcome to our Ivy Bridge Overclocking Guide. We are going to show you how to get the most out of your brand new Intel third generation or codename Ivy Bridge CPU using the latest 22 nanometer manufacturing process and pretty much like the ballinest performance out of anything. And we're gonna help you get more. Now, it is worth noting that while Ivy Bridge actually overclocks fairly well on air and water, similarly to the last generation Sandy Bridge in terms of sheer frequency, and even better on sub-zero cooling, it still, are, there are some caveats. So you gotta make sure that you pick the right gear. So first of all, we went with an MSI Z77A GD65. Out of the boards that I've personally worked with so far, this one was the easiest. Basically, you just, key in the values and then you just it just like it just works it was fairly simple also i love msi's click bios too it is very easy to navigate and everything is really really easy to find you will also need a substantial cooler because once you start overclocking ivy bridge because of the density of the transistors and the size of the die actually gets really hot even compared to last generation sandy bridge so you're going to want something like a corsair h80 or h100 one of these prefab liquid liquid coolers or a very large tower heatsink if you want to start really ramping up the frequency on your Intel third generation Core i5 or i7 processor. Next you will need a K series processor. So there's a lot of different Ivy Bridge chips. As long as you pick one that is a I something, so i5, i7, 30 something, 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 K. If it has a K on the end, then you will be able to easily overclock it. If it doesn't have a K on the end, you will be quite limited in terms of the overclocking that you can do. Now, if you're overclocking the snot out of your Ivy Bridge processor, you're probably gonna also want a decent graphics card. We went with a 7970, which is also happens to be a very good overclocker, this particular Dual X1 from Sapphire here. And we went with Kingston HyperX memory. We're not gonna be overclocking the memory much though, because with its on, uh, with its on-die memory controller, Ivy Bridge doesn't benefit that much from memory speeds in excess of the standard 1600 megahertz with CL9 latency. We're using a Patriot Wildfire SSD on our test bench and we're using a Corsair AX850 power supply because it's like just awesome pretty much. Now with newer processors with their unlocked multipliers, more on that in a moment, and incidentally older processors with their unlocked multipliers, uh, overclocking has become fairly simple. So all you have to do in terms of your memory, you pretty much just want to dial in whatever XMP profile you want. I mean you can tweak memory if you want, but in terms of the time investment that goes into it versus the performance reward that you get out of it, yeah, if you want high performance memory, just buy high performance memory and be done with it. Otherwise, it's pretty much not worth the effort. And no offense to those of you who believe it is worth the effort, go for it and like enjoy, but personally, I don't really bother with it. Whereas with the CPU, it's as simple as increasing the CPU ratio, which you can see right here in Click BIOS 2 is pretty straightforward. All you do is go to whatever like CPU ratio you wanna use. In this case, our default ratio is 35. So why don't we say, okay, we're gonna get a, you know, probably four gigahertz out of it, no problem. So you just increase that. And then all you do is you boot up, you test it, and we'll show you how to test it. So this is the multiplier, the CPU ratio. Um, you test it, make sure it's stable. And then if it's stable, you come in and you keep turning it up. So you take turns turning it up and then testing if it's stable until you reach the point where it's not stable. Then what you do is you go and you adjust the CPU voltage. So your CPU core voltage, in this case, in Click BIOS 2, you're going to find that somewhere down here. Just doing my scroll wheel thing. CPU voltage right there. You don't have to worry about most of these other settings unless you're getting more advanced. So you just bump the CPU core voltage up a little bit. I wouldn't really recommend going any higher then like 1.4-ish, 1.35 to 1.45 volts, especially because Ivy Bridge really stops scaling past a certain point as you add more voltage. So you bump a little bit and you get a huge reward, and then you bump a lot and you get a very small reward other than, well, more heat and more power consumption. So 
we are going to show you guys a pretty cool feature. Most motherboards have this feature these days called overclocking profiles. And I'm going to load up the overclocking profile that I have already saved and validated. And I'm going to show you guys the settings that we are using in it. So here we are using only a CPU core voltage of 1.15 because what I found with my sample CPU was that increasing the voltage gave me very little benefit beyond the 4.6 gigahertz that we were able to achieve at that limited voltage. So we're running our RAM at DDR3-1600 and our frequency at 4.6 gigahertz. Now I have turned off turbo because I don't want the frequency of the CPU moving around a lot for benchmark stability reasons. That way I can make sure I get the same scores all the time when I'm testing things like graphics cards. However, you may want to leave on features like turbo so that it will continue to ramp up or ramp down lesser or more depending on how many cores are active at a given time. So let's boot her up and get into Windows. Now let's have a look at how we validate the overclock once we reach the Windows environment. So I'm a little bit old school. I still use Prime95 in the small FFT option for torture test. I run one thread for each thread that the CPU is capable of supporting. And we go ahead, we check task manager, make sure that yes, all those threads are pinned. The CPU is at 100%. There are tools that do stress the CPU more. However, some of those like Linpack, for example, it's not really recommended to use anyway because they stress your CPU in a way that is even beyond what Intel does to stress them and is completely unrealistic. So there's two schools of thought on that. One is, well, I want to stress it as much as I possibly can to make sure it's as stable as possible. And the other is go for, go, going for the more realistic approach. So I take sort of this, yeah, I'd say it's kind of a middle ground because Prime95 is still very stressful, but it's not good enough to just play games and go, oh, my computer doesn't crash, therefore my overclock is stable. Not good enough. Um, so yeah, you want to make sure that runs for at least 24 hours to 48 hours to ensure that your overclock is stable before you go back to the BIOS and try to increase the frequency some more. Now I'm going to show you guys why I didn't dial this one up any more than it already is. I am already reaching about 85 degrees and because this is my test bench and I often run it in environments where I have to listen to it, I didn't want to turn up the fans on my Corsair H70 cooler any more than they already are. Now if I had an H100, I might be able to squeeze a little bit more out of this and keep the temperature is acceptable, but this is pretty much my personal threshold for maximum load temperature, so that was where I wanted to leave it and maintain a reasonable noise level for the system overall. Now if all of that looked way too complicated to you, there is an easy way. OC Genie 2 basically tunes your system your CPU, your RAM, and even your integrated GPU, although we're not using it, we have a dedicated graphics card. So all you have to do is press the OC Genie button, which I'm, we're not even going to do a close-up of this because it's so simple. You just press it, the light turns on, you power on the system. I had to clear the BIOS before doing this because OC Genie can conflict with other BIOS settings. You don't want to tune the BIOS manually and use OC Genie. You want to do one or the other. It's going to give me a little warning about how OC Genie is enabled, or at least it's supposed to. Okay. Uh, all right, so when you enable OC Genie, you see this message here, and when the computer boots up, you are going to see that if you don't go into the BIOS by accident, sorry about that, guys, we are going to boot right into Windows with the touch of one button while the computer is off, and we are going to have an overclock that, while it's not as aggressive as you could manually tune, is certainly functional and certainly faster than the processor was from the get-go. So in this way, MSI, and for that matter, the other board manufacturers have similar overclocking tools, although OC Genie I'm particularly fond of just because it's super simple and always works. And no, my Windows is not invalid. It is invalid, but only because I'm changing the hardware constantly and it takes like eight minutes to call Microsoft and reactivate it every time. So uh, what can I say? Moving along, CPU-Z, Prime95, and we are dialed in at 4.2 gigahertz. And when we load up the CPU, it's actually running quite cool. So you can see MSI has tuned their OC Genie to not really increase the voltage very much, but go for more of a, well, a less aggressive overall frequency than what we did on our own. So thank you for checking out our Ivy Bridge platform introduction and overclocking guide. Don't forget to subscribe to NCIX Tech Tips.